Right, let's kick off day two with a joint presentation with Passive Bolt on what kinds of benefits IMSE has for home appliance design. And Passive Bolt is our customer, which Taxotec supported to create their award-winning keyless entry system, Shepherd Lock, of which you will also hear more about soon. And now I'm very pleased to introduce Sini Rytki from Taxotec. Hi, guys. And Kabir Maika from Passive Bolt. Hi, everybody. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And Sini, please take it from here. Thanks, Tua. Also welcome from my side. Today, we're going to start with a short recap on what, what is possible with IMSC, then continue discussing about the challenges and IMSC solutions for home appliances, and conclude with our customer Passive Bolt introducing their Shepherd Smart Lock. But let's start with the basics. What can you actually do with IMSC today? The foundations are called IMSC platforms. Those being all the verified materials and components from conductive inks and components and all the way to different film and plastic substrates and their combinations. On top of the platform are the technology modules, which we call IMSC building blocks. Those form the functional features that are selected based on the customer need and respective use case, obviously. We've divided the IMSC building blocks into five different categories. Touch for capacitive sensing elements, sense for, for example, proximity sensing, illuminate for, for example, small functional illuminated symbols, or a more um, non-functional larger area ambient illumination type of feature. Then connectivity, printed antennas and coils, and ultimately the look and feel, different kinds of surface materials and treatments for the ultimate look and feel of a IMSC part. Also, these are the functions that are currently integrated inside the in-molded IMSC structure. In addition to these functionalities, the IMSC structures can be complemented with external structures as well. So for example, the haptics actuators can be in uh, incorporated with an IMSC part if there is such a need. Then looking at the home appliances in particular, the human machine interface is one of the most important points of contact obviously between the product and a user. At its best, the HMI provides intuitive and responsive controls for the customer and also contributes the overall design of the product. With home appliances, achieving um, cost-effective differentiation between brands is also difficult. An appealing HMI as part of the complete design is one of the keys towards brand differentiation and standing out in the eyes of the consumer. Now, as users, you and I, we all navigate through I would say dozens of different HMIs and designs every single day. They are often compromised by the boundaries of conventional electronics and often it takes significant time to learn how to use a new appliance, for instance. At its best, um, great HMI doesn't only provide the intuitive and responsive controls, but also enables beautiful design features that really bring the experience of using a product to a whole new level. Let's take a look at some of the main challenges for conventional com components in a box structures and how we can help overcome those challenges with IMSC. Now, creating HMIs that define brand identity is significantly limited in terms of shapes, styles and functionality. And very often, um, customizing the HMI in terms of cosmetics, functionality or both, requires new tooling, at, at the very least for some parts of the conventional assembly. Also, creation of seamless surfaces with functionality, great looks, and easy to clean properties is very difficult and typically will force the design to some kind of compromise. Now, secondly, with conventional methods, the total cost efficiency, it, it's really a difficult task to manage. Due to complex part structures, 
that create a need for multiple tool sets, assembly line setups, and often complicated labor intensive, uh, labor intensive supply chain as well. And thirdly, every electromechanical interface is obviously a reliability risk at the same time, as well as many times a high priced line item in the bill of materials. With increasing demand for more sophisticated controls in the HMIs, managing both the cost and reliability risks becomes more and more challenging. So looking at those three major topics, let's see how we can help overcome those challenges with IMSC. Designing a three-dimensional HMI with IMSC enables the use of functional design elements as brand identity elements. This could be as simple as an illuminated power button with brand specific geometry, for instance, or a more streamlined full HMI design language that is consistent from every appliance throughout the different product categories. The HMI is also extremely thin, which opens up a whole new world of design possibilities, not only for the geometry of the part itself, but also in terms of where the HMI can be placed. So what it means in practice is that since the HMI is so thin, it can go over the appliance surface, which enables the customization of the HMI without actually having to make any changes to the surrounding mechanics, which means that the appliance is then customized as late as possible in the assembly process. Keeping surfaces clean is very easy and there is no risk for damaging the HMI or the components inside because all the functional features are encapsulated in plastics. So they're completely protected from, for example, debris and moisture and safe to be sanitized as well with most common household cleaners. Secondly, let's spend a little time on discussing the total cost efficiency. Now, since you all know that the IMSC part is a single piece structure, so it's created with a single injection molding tool. This cuts down the tooling expenses significantly compared to conventional structures. Now, this applies both to the actual fabrication of the tools, but also to the related design and engineering work for those tools. With IMSC, most of the assembly steps in production are removed. Functional and graphical localization for IMSC is done with printing, which then eliminates the time consuming and often expensive tooling changes for different localized variants. What the reduced complexity also means is less time and effort spent on design and engineering, less components to manage in the inventory, less vendors to manage and significantly simplify flow of goods altogether. And as the third major, major item, looking at the competitive edge, one electromechanical interface that results in durable and reliable structures while keeping the HMI safe from external hazards at the same time. Now, the advanced intuitive functionalities from high sensitivity capacitive switches with beautiful illumination to, for example, incorporating a wireless antenna radiator directly onto the structure and basically anything from the building blocks that we just um, shared before. Any, of, any and all of those functionalities can be mixed and matched um, based, based on the customer and use case requirement. With the ability to transform the HMI design into three dimensions, providing intuitive guidance for the user um, by designing smart geometries directly onto the part. This could be anything from a subtle texture on the surface or a guiding geometrical feature that guides the user to interact with the HMI with ease. And last but not least, the IMSC enables the creation of consistent HMI logic in a single part structure that can be customized uh, to deliver and carry the brand identity throughout the product categories providing elegant and more so familiar functions for the end user that are easily recognized and easily learned by the users as well. 
So to summarize very briefly, IMSC enables new ways for brand differentiation, but does it with total cost efficiency, resulting in competitive edge. Next, we will hear more about that competitive edge from, from our customer passive bolts. Please, Kabir, over to you. Thanks for having me. Uh, pleasure to be here and talk about um, uh, our product Shepherd. Um, and also to talk a little bit more about Passive Bolt um, and all of our activi activities as they relate to IMSC. Um, so, you know, just for the sake of this conversation, I'll just briefly um, be going over uh, roughly four slides. Uh, first, we're going to just talk a little bit about Passive Bolt, a little bit about us, what we're about, um, who we are, that kind of stuff. Next, then I'd like to do a quick overview of our product Shepherd, um, and also then next discuss what IMSC uh, utilization we uh, uh, you know we've leveraged in the design um, and implementation of the product, and then finally why we chose to work with IMSC as opposed to uh, some of the existing technologies. So Shepherd, I mean Passive Bolt, were based out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, we spun up from uh, Continental Automotive actually uh, about uh, two years ago, back in 2018. Uh, Continental is a, a, one of the uh, largest uh, automotive tier ones, um, where I was formerly the lead, um, uh, I was technical lead for keyless entry systems uh, for vehicles. That's technologies that let you, you know, seamlessly or in a, in a highly convenient way get in and out, out in and out of a vehicle um, and also the start functions. Um, so what we've done with my core team is decided to really leverage, you know, all of that experience that we have with keyless entry from an automotive automotive point of view and and deliver uh, you know that in the smart home update in a different form factor um, so we said to essentially redesign um, you know our solution so that it fits uh, within smart home but really delivers the user experience that you know uh, consumers have come to uh, like and appreciate um, when using an, an automobile um, in, in the sense of you know walking up to your door touching the handle unlocks go in push a button start and go really simple way to you know to utilize your car without having to juggle keys. Um, and in this process, I'll say, you know, as a company, what we've done is created a, a, a you know, a beachhead um, brand, which we're calling Shepherd, uh, that allows us to essentially deliver that value to the customer. It's sort of our proof of concept brand, uh, but really at the core, we're more of a B2B focused company where we're working with companies that, you know, let's say we would call home automation companies so companies that sell portfolios of smart home products. Um, you can think of you know, home security companies, MBUs, uh, builders, et cetera. So companies like that, where we offer them the, uh, the ability to take a ready-made tested solution that they can brand and take to market. So the, you know, Shepherd, which is the product that you know, I was talking about is our, uh, let's say our flagship brand. Um, you know, the way it works is, is truly extraordinary. You can see the product here on, in, in that picture on the right, um, you know, with that uh, smooth finish, um, with all of the functionality built right into the cover for the interior use. Um, it is a retrofit lock. What that means then is obviously you would install it on the existing lock set chassis. So in this case, you can see from this picture, this is inside of the home. Our product adapts the existing deadbolt. So outside you keep that same existing deadbolt inside you install our product easily with just two screws and you put this cover right over it which is what's visible in this picture but once you do that then you unlock some of the key automotive features that we have right um, which we're bringing here so that's the touch as an example you can touch your existing deadbolt and no it doesn't need to connect collect your fingerprint um, it's utilizing virtual keys just like the vehicle does right so we triangulate and locate the key uh, we run um, a challenge, it passes, it unlocks. In milliseconds, you can touch your lock and it unlocks automatically, you go in. Once inside of the house, you can also touch the lock and unlock. You can see that finger, um, you know, uh, it's essentially on a touch sensor, which basically from inside for egress purposes, no keys required, it would lock and unlock the door instantly. Um, and on top of that, we brought some, you know, additional features that are also unique to the market. So the conversion that I just mentioned of the you know, traditional deadbolt into a touch activated device is a first to market from passive bolt. But second, we also added some security features leveraging our touch technology, which allows you to be able to detect perhaps, you know, uh, uh, for example, when somebody's trying to pick a deadbolt and, you know, it would freeze the lock temporarily as long as somebody's attempting to pick the lock, sound an alarm, 
uh, communicate with our partners, control panel as an example, right? Same thing with, you know, uh, a first market brute force detection, where if somebody kicks down the door and alarm goes off, homeowner gets notified. Uh, but on top of that, you know, uh, we have one more uh, technology that's enabling actually the brute force, which is the ability to know when the doors open or close, or really anywhere in between, uh, leveraging a built-in sensor uh, technology that we've developed, which, you know, does away with the need to drill, um, you know, hollow effect sensor onto your door frame, which is the state of the art, right? So that's one more first to market from Passive Bolt. Um, again, with these and many more innovations that we brought to the space, we've received the CES Innovation Award for 2020 um, uh, this year. We've received many more awards, um, such as, you know, uh, being a, a, a nominated and shortlisted for the best consumer IoT coming to the market in 2020, and ultimately being one of the few companies, along with Amazon, uh, that uh, were honored at IoT World, um, you know, mentions in top seven for Forbes for 2020 technologies, et cetera. Um, and, you know, so we're, we're really proud of, you know, Shepard as a flagship brand, flagship product that we've designed, um, which incorporates IMSC technology um, and is delivering innovative uh, technologies. In terms of IMSC, I'll cover, um, you know, the way we've implemented, the way we've utilized it in this product. Um, so this is the face of the product. Um, this piece is our IMSC component, the black piece. And as you can see, it's got a, a built-in LED. That's So this illuminated feature is essentially printed onto the, uh, uh, the plastic cover. So it's IMSC based. Um, and that allows us to provide you know, uh, an indication of feedback to the user seamlessly. We've got the touch sensor right below that, which is that rectangle. It's not as evident in this picture, but the finish is slightly different uh, for that touch sensor surface, you know, which signals to the user, this is where you touch. So you can issue a touch command for locking and unlocking the door from inside of the home. And then at the bottom, you know, we, you know, we have a, a printed logo. Again, that gives us flexibility as a B2B company in terms of being able to swap out that logo in future iterations, right? The finish itself is just clean, smooth, and elegant. In this case, it's a glossy finish, uh, but with, you know, IMSC, we're able to iterate that finish again just by changing that top layer. So that gives us a ton of flexibility in terms of uh, the different finishes we could take to market without retooling or changing the design in any way. Um, the cover that's around it in silver is plastic um, and it's magnetized. So the black cover, the black piece just snaps right into it. And the whole assembly between these two, the black and the silver, uh, could be removed from the product without using any tools. And that's how you access batteries to swap out the batteries. But you, you can see uh, uh, here that, you know, the use of this IMSC technology allows us to have good touch LED and a design that could be iterated in terms of logo. So then I'll tell you why we chose IMSC instead of using conventional technology to achieve this, right? Uh, but you know, one of the driving reasons is that if we wanted to create a touch sensor uh, for inside, um, we would have, you know, because our, you know, uh, our circuit board resides below the plastic, we would have had to design a method, a way of basically conveying touch all the way to the surface, right? But in a way that's still limited to that touch surface that we've determined and not go beyond that. That has proved to be incredibly challenging in terms of reliability, uh, robustness, and quality uh, prior to IMSE. But with you know having the ability to print that sensor right on the surface does away with set complexities. So we're able to you know minimize tooling, which is the second great benefit here, um, able to essentially deliver that touch feature um, in a way that is seamless. But you can see, I mentioned earlier that the cover is actually removable because what we've done is we've divorced the aesthetics uh, from the functional piece, which we're calling a module that sits right below that cover. If you remove that magnetized cover and you get access to this module, then you know, in order for us to actually have um, you know, the ability to have an LED feedback on the surface, a touch sensor, we would have had to come up with a complex tooling strategy to get that done. But with IMSC, because it's fully printed into the plastic uh, and a clean finish, um, we all we needed was just to leverage a few pads, um, connection pads, you know, small and uh, uh, sort of up to the side. We're able to convey, um, you know, we were able to connect to the cover and be able to convey feedback to the user without needing um, to, uh, without needing to, you know. Uh, result uh, or at least uh, take advantage of complex tooling strategies. 
This makes for a really robust, reliable design where, you know, the touch is highly robust, the LED, the elegance and the, you know, fullness of the, the, the you know, LED indication that you get um, is, 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 is priceless. But more importantly, as a B2B company, uh, once again, the, the ability to change that logo um, without having to retool. Um, and when we're you know, talking to, let's say, a regional home security company that we're supplying, right? This gives us flexibility. It gives us the ability to sell them a branded solution, um, AKA, you know, a, a white label for us, branded for them, where, you know, if they weren't able to support volume, say beyond 10K, would be able to just swap out a top film uh, with uh, their logo included. And that gives us, that gives us flexibility, um, you know, in terms of our ability to uh, satisfy market needs without having to incur costs or charge NRE costs to set customers uh, to create uh, additional tooling, right? Uh, that, that's, that's a really big differentiator for us, uh, the way we see using, um, you know, conventional molding versus IMSC to achieve these features. Thank you, Kapir, and thank you, Sini, for your excellent presentation. And now let's have a short panel discussion. So first, Kapir, going forward, how do you see the smart lock industry develop in the coming years? And what do you think are the main functionalities that the future smart locks will carry? Yeah, um, thank you. And, and the way we really see the smart you know, lock space developing is um, you know, a renewed and continued focus on user experience. Uh, user experience is king. You know, the whole point of a hardware product is that it be intuitive, um, easy to use, and that you know, um, homeowners um, or users, generally speaking, um, you know, are able to derive a great experience. Um, meaning the UX uh, must be great, um, and so we see touch as a critical function of that. Um, that's, you know, sort of core to our design approach um, anyway. Um, the ability to just come and do something as easy as touch to indicate what you want, um, you know, as a means of, let's say, measuring user intent is a powerful way to enhance user experience. Um, and we've leveraged that and we expect the industry to continue to leverage that moving forward. We expect facial recognition to rise up as well as a means of authentication, therefore eliminating the need for, let's say, you know, a mobile phone or fob, et cetera. Um, again, that continues the same trend, which is, you know, improving user experience, right? The ability to just walk up, be recognized just, you know, because of your face and then be able to just touch to issue a few commands. That, that level of intuitiveness um, brings a certain elegance um, and a certain, you know, just let's say oneness with technology. And that's where we see the industry going. How about you, Sini, what do you think? I think we share a lot of similarities between our thinking with Kabir as well. And obviously for Tactotech as a co company, um, we need to be, we need to make sure that our technology enables that improved user experience. Uh, which in many cases today means that we need to be able to uh, increase the electronic functionality that actually is embedded in the devices. So from future development point of view, we basically have three themes where we focus. So first being to um, increase the amount of IMSC platforms to, to serve the rapidly increasing amount of use cases for IMSC, which basically means the verification of material stacks that act as basis for any IMSC product design. Secondly, um, as Kabir mentioned, touch is one of the key elements in the smart locks um, today and in the future as well. Um, our roadmap also considers um, adding new functionalities with the IMSC structures. So going from basic um, capacitive single sensor or multiple sensor structures to, for example, tra uh, trackpad implementations, or for example, new building blocks for illumination features. And thirdly, um, we really focus on increasing the um, amount and complexity of electronic components that can be in-molded within the IMSC structures. And actually, how we are planning to go about, about that, um, you will hear more in our coming um, technology vision presentation today. Exactly. And then about the shepherd lock, with, which um, Kaburi already discussed in your presentation, 
Uh, in the Shepherd Lock, you have brought an innovation from the automotive industry and adapted that into a smart lock. So do you see this type of technology adaptable for other smart home applications, such as smart home controls, for example? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think, you know, there's really, there could be more use of touch surfaces of, you know, um, let's say, you know, built-in LED feedbacks, etc., such as things enabled with the IMSC piece um, as part of our Shepherd Lock design. But more broadly, though, I think, you know, there needs to be some level of uniform, you know, like a uniform user experience, uniform UX across devices in a smart home. Uh, we see smart locks as just being one piece of the home automation, um, uh, you know, uh, let's say uh, system. So if you're really looking to provide a homeowner with a full home, you know, smart home, let's say uh, experience, uh, it, it behooves you as a designer to consider, um, you know, that all the devices that are being connected uh, be share some level of, let's say, um, you know, user experience uh, or some level of consistency in terms of you know, how to use or experience those devices. So it, it would make sense to have, um, you know, an entire smart home package that carries the same design philosophy throughout. So we definitely see room for extending our design approach, design thinking, user experience approach to devices beyond. Okay, how about from tactic point of view Sini? I would definitely like to see a smart lock in my refrigerator from time to time, maybe to <laughs> block me from using it. Um, but I think overall, the way we see the smart home controls develop is that all electronic device devices in our homes are coming smart. So they are increasingly embedding, for example, connectivity features that allow the consumers benefit from additional services that are made available by the OEMs. Also, what we see is that the devices carry increasing amount of functionalities like, um, like, for example, the Shepherd lock. It's not just a lock, but at the same time, it's also your home security system that lets you know, you know if your door is left open, for example. Um, so the increased amount of uh, functionalities obviously set certain challenges then for the UI, HMI and the UX design. And being able to provide um, new design freedom in terms of, for example, three-dimensional shapes is essential. And I think also one thing that applies um, to the smart home environment is the kind of um, shy tech approach, which we have already um, learned about in yesterday's presentations, where um, basically all the technology is hidden until you, uh, until you need to use it. Right. Yeah, I, I would also like to see the smart lock uh, in many other places as well. For example, in the fridge door, like Sini mentioned. <laughs> um, Kapir, you already mentioned that you've started shipping products and primarily you are first targeting the US market. So what are your plans on expanding your technology into other geographies? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, too. Uh, I mean, I think next up, we're going to go to our neighbor up in Canada. That seems like a natural fit um, to expand, um, you know, north. Uh, but, you know, down the line later in 2021, uh, we're going to be going across the pond over um, into the UK market and then beyond that into the EU market. Uh, that's our uh, roadmap for uh, global expansion at the moment. All right. Sini. From from doctor point of view, how does this sound? Sounds great. We are looking forward to see Shepherd Locks in Canada next. Um, from Tactotech point of view, um, one of the key elements of Tactotech strategy is to grow an entire IMSC ecosystem, both for uh, components and material supply, but also for the IMSC parts design and manufacturing. Um, our technology licensing packages enable the OEMs to use, for example, their existing supply chains, uh, use globally available materials and components that are industrialized as IMSC platforms. And obviously, we want to uh, make sure that our customers have the fastest time to market with IMSC technology. Okay, excellent. Oh. 
It's unfortunately already time for us to close this panel discussion. So I would like to thank you, Kapir, and thank you, Sini, for uh, being here with us today. And uh, would you like to send any greetings to the IMSC Days audience? Thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure uh, uh, speaking here today, and uh, I appreciate you two all for having us. Thank you, Sini. Have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you also from my side, and thanks, Kabir. It's nice to, nice to talk to you again. Um, and greetings to our audience. Um, let's keep the show going. Exactly. Thank you from me as well, and soon it's time for the next presentation.
And now it's time for the next presentation of the day. Capacitive Touch is quickly growing in popularity for a wide range of use cases in many markets. And the superior performance of Capacitive Touch implemented with IMSC technology makes it particularly appealing. However, in some use cases, as Capacitive Touch controls replace mechanical buttons, tactile feedback is needed. And that's why haptics have become so important. And I'm very pleased to introduce Iwasaki-san from Kyocera, who will tell us about Haptivity, Kyocera's haptic solution. So please, Iwasaki-san, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Tosan, to introduce me. My name is Iwasaki. I'm quite happy to have a presentation for this uh, topics. Today, I will explain Haptivity, Kyocera's haptic technology. You may be wondering why IMSE they bring this up, but IMSE and the Haptivity are in fact complementary relationships, and I am confident that the market will expand. I will mention it in today's session. Thank you for your cooperation today. Here is today's announcement. First, I will mention Haptivity, Kyocera's haptic technology. Then I explain how to implement this technology. In addition, I introduce the combination with IMSC technology. Lastly, I would like to summarize the direction of Kyocera. Then, what is Haptivity? People press some things. Maybe this child is experimenting how much the glass needs to be pushed to break. In any case, people push things for some reason. For example, press the remote control to switch TV channels. For example, press the keyboard to type an email to decide uh, today's lunch menu. For example, if you have a button that might cause something to happen, you might press it to see what happened. In this way, people press, press some things, but how do they detect the feeling of the pressing? Let's look at the biology aspect that you are good at when you are a student, but, and I was bad at. This picture is a cross-section of human skin. In the terms of hand, the red frame on the left side touches the back of your hand, and the blue frame on the right side becomes the palm of your hands or your fingertips. If you look at the cross-section, there are four sensory organs, two near the surface, two deep. You can also see that the shapes and the size are different. These four senses sense touch. How are these four senses organs different? On the surface, the mycena cell and the Merkel cell, less stimulation area because they are on the surface. The deep Pacinian cell and Ruffini cell provide a wide range of sensation and yet another parameter. Rapid adapting and slow adapting are different reaction rate. Rapid adaption as RA mainly detect first motion such as vibration. Slow adapting as SA, on the other hand, detect slow motion such as pressure. Remember that these are two detectors each, especially two rabbit adapting, adaptation sensor is existing. I'll come back to this later. What happens when you push the button with your fingers? Then let's press the button. Here are an example of two types of buttons. The horizontal, the horizontal axis is a stroke, and the vertical axis is a stress at that time. The blue line is a metal dome switch. First, the pressure will gradually increase until it reaches about 0.7 millimeter. Then, the pressure drops momentarily. This indicates that the shape of the metal dome is deformed by being pressed and has transformed to another face. After that, even if you keep pushing, you can't push it anymore. And you can't push it at about 0.8 millimeter and pressure will rise. 
red is lava dome switch. The pressure increases gradually compared to the metal dome after being pushed to about 0.7 meter in the same manner as the metal dome, it gradually moved to another phase. It in incidates that it cannot be pushed it in about 1.5 millimeter. This graph shows that the pushing speed is one millimeter for 30 seconds. So the movement is very slow. The dynamic movement is diff different. But in any case, the finger detects that pressing the button sinks, the pressure drop along the way, and finally the pressure rise as it cannot be pressed anymore. The key to haptivity, haptivity is to reflect pressure fluctuation on the fingertips in virtual reality. Kyocera defines Haptivity as a technology that uses a combination of pressure and touch or vibration to stimulate the nerves at the fingertips. From year 2014 to 15, 21 basic patents were issued and registered as Kyocera technologies. Kyocera is ready to have a license agreement with use, user for haptivity. Now, let's think about how to implement this. As we have seen, haptivity uses pressure as a parameter and vibrates to stimulate the fingers. Therefore, you need a sensor to detect pressure and an actuator to generate vibration. First, let's look at the performance required for actuators. In the previous slide, I explained that there are four sensors, two of which are quick to detect vibration as rapid adaptation. What are the characteristics of these organs? This graph shows frequency on the horizontal axis and stroke on the vertical axis. Meissner cell have these characteristics. On the other hand, Pacini is a very sensitive sensor that can detect movement of several micrometers at around 200 Hz. By these two sensory organs, the green area is said to be the area that people can detect. What kind of vibration parameter should be given to sensor organs with these characteristics? And you press a button with your fingertips, you feel strength of the buttons, the spring feeling, the sharpness, and the comfortable feeling, etc. On the other hand, the actuator controls the stroke, acceleration, frequency, and digital wave number as convergence. We conduct a survey to determine what these connections might look like and examine the range of the buttons that people want or present feedback. This is what it looks like when uh, superimposed on the previous graph. The dark green in the middle is a sweet spot to have a good feeling for fingertip. Smaller strokes are less responsive. On the other hand, if you make it strong, you will feel pain. It feels sharper when you rise the frequency again. If you lower the frequency, you will feel the softness. This parameter is important for changing the tactile sense of the metal dome and rubber dome switch. From these results, the actuator specification to be determined as, a fo as follow. Acceleration of 5G or more. Frequency is 100 to 300 Hertz we found that the stroke of 40 micrometer or more is suitable. These parameters are important for haptic vibration. So what kind of actuator is to feel these things? The commonly available actuators are shown. Each has its own characteristics. Vibration motor, linear actuator, piezo actuator, and solenoid. 
I explained that the frequency is necessary to reach 100 to 300 hertz. Among them, the piezo actuator excels in frequency characteristics. We have chosen the piezo actuator because it is small and quick response. Let me briefly mention the piezo used here. Piezo is a dielectric with crystal anisotropy. This is an individual that generates a voltage by changing its shape when voltage is applied and by changing its shape. A material called PZT has particularly excellent properties and is widely used as a piezoelectric element. Generally, a polycrystalline structure is used for the piezo element and it is manufactured by firing the powder in the same way as ceramics. Here comes the word ceramic. Ah, sorry. Mm, just a moment. Yes. Our company name is Kyocera Corporation. Kyocera comes from Kyoto Ceramic. In other words, we have the design, development, and manufacture of this piezoelectric element, and we can obtain the element suitable for this activity. If an appropriate voltage is applied as an actuator, this piezoelectric element can be moved to generate vibration. On the other hand, as mentioned earlier, external force or stress generate voltage. If you use it well, you can use it as a pressure sensor at the same time. However, there is one problem. It is good that the piezo works as the, at the high speed, small, and can be used as a pressure sensor. But as I mentioned earlier, the amount of deformation is very small. If you don't fix this, you will not be able to get more than the previous 40 micrometer stroke. As mentioned above, the deformation of the piezoelectric element is on the order of micrometer. In order to amplify this amount of deformation, we have solved this problem by bonding with an amplified leaf spring. As a basic structure, we overcome this defect by attaching a metal shim plate and the piezo and extending the deformation amount by foot to make it vibrate specifically. By sandwiching between the housing and the object to be vibrated, vibration is generated. How can thin and delicate element be easily incorporated? Moreover, how can we provide stable operation in a way that is not damaged by external force and how can we make installation easy, inexpensive, and usable by anyone? We are thinking to providing it in the form of haptic block. To do this, we developed two types of blocks. As mentioned earlier, the piezo element is ceramic. If a large external force is applied and the force larger than the amount of deformation of the piezo element, the piezo element will break. Type 1 has a stopper that prevents the piezo element from breaking when a large external force is applied. Type 2, on the other hand, has a simple structure, but it does not have a stopper. So it is necessary to consider the structure to prevent break on the installation side. Both structures are screwed onto the housing and the object to be vibrated and are used as clamps. Based on this, we have made various demonstration devices and have been actively promoting the implementation of activity mainly for in vehicle display from year 2017 to 18. It is mainly used for the center information display, which is installed between the driver's seat and the passenger's seat. In order to vibrate a heavy object of one kilogram or more, like a display, multiple actuators are required. Also, when several components are joined together from the point of vibration to the surface where the finger actually touched, 
damping occur to transmit the vibration, which is a design limitation. From these experience, the advantage for piezo actuator are light, hard, and simple. Just then, IMSE has arrived. As you know, IMSE features a simple, lightweight, rigid shell structure and the mat uh, that matches piezo actuators. This means that haptic block under the above structure can be placed directly under the IMSE. IMSE, effective smart switch, feedback desired for many use cases. On the other hand, haptivity, which use piezo elements, required a light and rigid structure. These two things happen by chance. So what exactly can we do? Let's see what we can do with the steering switch. One, low number of assembly parts. Two, higher reliability. Three, 3D shape surface with touch sensor. Four, light and thin. Five, of course, it's able to have activity function. Indicate the feature list. I decide to act, uh, actually make something like this. The steering switch is equipped with a sensor function, including a slider function, LED icon display, and haptivity, and is desi designed to withstand the LV124, which is a European automotive standard. This is what we made. Many OEM have touched this demo unit. They were satisfied with the tactile sensation, and we felt that we were able to create something that our customers wanted that matches the CNES and 3D shape design. In this way, the collaboration between Haptivity of Kyocera and IMC of Tactotech was realized as one form. Haptivity and IMC intend to propose new switch possibilities for various applications. Concerning for the hardware part, this is block diagram. Host MCU with peripheral circuit control capacitive sensor with IMC and also haptivity system. Piezo works for pressure sensor and also actuator. There is a port in MCU to contact main controller if necessary. I show you how it works. Finger touch to the surface, sensor detect position and MCU catch the event, MCU change to pressure sensor mode, MCU start to check voltage from piezo element, pushing, 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 and reach to threshold voltage. Then MCU change to actuator mode, MCU send signal to piezo element, then piezo element change shape and vibration will be detected by finger. And then MCU change again for the pressure sense mode, start pressure sensing, then finger releasing, and then pressure is uh, decreasing and reach to a threshold voltage. Again, go to uh, actuator mode, MCU send the signal to piezo element. The piezo element change shape and the vibration will be detected by finger. And then come back to start. These senses e simulate button push and these sequence simulate button push and release. Even the stroke is less than 0 0.1 millimeter finger feel nearly same as mechanical switch. Next, next is the uh, last chapter. This is Kyocera's vision for IMC. One direction is to provide a new HMI based on the steering switch mentioned above. We plan to expand this system to various HMIs. We will use the advantage of IMC and the piezo activity to explore new markets. On the other hand, Kyocera has many products other than piezo elements. We intend to use IMC technology to create new value for these devices, especially connectors, LCD, 
optical components, and so on. So let me conclude by saying, today we start by explain, explaining what is haptivity through explanation, how people get their touch. Then we understand that piezo elements are suitable for haptivity. Collaboration between IMSE and haptivity is desirable for both parties. As a first possibility, Kyocera and Tactic made a steering switch unit and demonstrated to OEM. Finally, Kyocera suggests suggest that IMSE technology has a lot of potential not only in haptivity, but also in creating new value. That's all for my presentation. If you have a question, please contact me. Thank you for your listening. Thank you, Iwasaki-san, for your great presentation. And next up, we have a few questions. So, Iwasaki-san, we have a few questions for you, which we would like to discuss. Uh, first, in comparison to conventional electromechanical structures, what is the effect on number of actuators needed, and perhaps their size, needed power, freedom in placing the actuators, and, and so forth? Okay, so the our haptic block, maybe like this, size is like this. Okay. okay. Yeah. So our haptic block, this block is able to shake about 500 gram with one element. It means one element can shake 500, roughly. Of course, it is uh, depend on hardness and structure. For example, if we shake flat, a plastic plate with an one actuator, one plate, one actuator, then it's like a wave. Okay, so uh, the uh, you can okay you can imagine that the surface will move as a wave. And actuator, another parameter is shown to fix the position of the object. It means a flat only one. It's quite easy to tilt. Mm. Normally, if we need to fix some things, more than three point is necessary to fix. Then piezo actuator is able to work 500, but of course we need to put some other point to fix some things. Bigger size, we need to take care. If it is small, we can, uh, we can uh, let me say, neglect this part. Some one point is enough. So it's me. It is depend on design. Weight is an important issue, and the size, and how softness, and uh, big, where, many things is a parameter. So, uh, but uh, if we think about it, so the one is for our side, piezo is, is very good for the quite hard one because it can move like not like this. So IMC technology's good point is we can put one thing, everything to enter everything, like a three millimeter or something inside the LED, et cetera. So for us, uh, if we adapt IMC, this is quite good for the haptivity, for the vibrating, and it's hard. Then of course we can make some point where is a connection this is also we can do it. So it's been the, let me say, IMC is good for us to make a vibration. So do you see an effect on the noise level with using IMSC or the implications of reliability when in IMSC structures, there are less parts and less mechanical interfaces? Okay, so the noise is a key point to have haptic feedback. So I mentioned 200 hertz. This is hearable frequency range. Then nobody can escape from uh, some sound. This is a possibility to less sound with damper or counter pulse or waveform or vibration direction, etc. But in any case, it is necessary to consider. For example, okay, so. This is a metal dome switch. I don't know where is a mic, but uh, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, you can hear. So this is a normal metal dome switch. Any case, there is some sound. Okay, and 
This is our demonstration unit. Maybe you can hear some sound. Mm -hmm. And of course, if we change the frequency, sound is a little bit higher. So this is uh, quite normal. No way, nobody can escape for this noise. But uh, it means that even we use the IMC or non common way, sound will not a difference. It's not a big factor. But one issue is uh, still we have. So maybe you have a, you heard about the word of a lateral click noise. Lateral click noise is uh, some uh, binding for the two. So the shaking, then it will make uh, some squeeze noise like this. So the vibration is of course come from the environment like a car, car vibration. Okay, it will make uh, some noise. This is a possibility. And also, activity. This is a 200 hertz. It's moved very quick. So there is some possibility to make a noise from this point. So if I use IMC, so the mechanical part becomes simple, then noise possibility becomes less. This is sure. OK, noise is a, this is a point. And also the reliability part. So the, this is also not, it's a common way. So the reliability part less part number is better. This is sure. So we made uh, this. OK, I already explained. So we made this uh, demonstration unit. And we made a, a little bit test for the LV124, as I explained. So it is still on the way. But today, uh, we have we have not any uh, problem related for the haptic and the IMC. So I believe so today we have no big issue for the reliability. And uh, I hope there is some advantage with IMC for the reliability. Thank you, Iwasaki-san, for your excellent presentation and for your answers to these questions. And we really appreciate you taking the time to participate in the, in the event. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So oh, hello again, and I hope that you have enjoyed the previous two presentations. Um, as mentioned, unfortunately, due to time differences, we weren't able to have the live Q and A's after these sessions. So if you have any questions regarding, for example, the first uh, IMSC in home appliances um, presentation or the previous Haptivity by Kiosera, please send in your questions. Uh, to tactodeckevents.com and we will do our best to answer those as soon as possible. And next, in about 15 minutes, we have the next presentation about the Origo steering wheel. Uh, so please stay tuned.
Next, we have a joint presentation by Tactotech and Sealy Auto about the Orico steering wheel and the benefits IMSC has for graphical user interface design. Tactotech and Sealy Auto joined forces with other Finnish automotive ecosystem members to co-create the Orico steering wheel concept, the future driving experience. And next, Hasse Sinivara from Tactotech and Timo Posio from Sealy Auto will tell you more about the concept. Hasse, please take it from here. All right, thank you, Tuwa. Uh, hello, everybody in the internet um, around, and welcome into this 10-minute uh, speed course into uh, Origo steering wheel concept. Um, I'm going through some basic ideas of the user experience philosophy uh, and the selections we made uh, for the design itself, um, a bit of why it looks how it looks and, and why it functions as it functions. Um, but first, uh, let's take a sneak peek on the, the animated video clip uh, of the Origo itself. Okay, so that's the um, a sneak peek of, of the concept itself. And I'm gonna talk about through the, the some of the UX philosophies we, we had in, in the background to, to basically define how the HMI and the lighting architecture is, is gonna be designed in, in the steering wheel itself as well with the, within the GUI. Um, so first, uh, as everybody knows, the uh, trending in the automotive is, is, of course, the media screens and specifically touchscreens. So uh, center consoles are coming with the touchscreen uh, interfaces and the displays are basically taking over the, the mechanical, uh, electromechanical switching environment in, in that sense. Um, so um, the basic philosophy we kind of thought is, is how to reduce the, the media screen interaction time for the driver so that there's a minimal distractions for the driver. Um, he or she, they can, they can basically concentrate on driving, but still uh, they can operate the system in a, in a most fluent way. Um, so um, we also kind of a thought that let's make it very sim simplistic. So let's say Scandinavian style is, is very sim simple. So, so our, um, logic HMI is, is very simple in, in design, so there's no, not many logic buttons, uh, so you don't have to really learn. Um, a, a majority of, of, let's say, tens of, of buttons itself. Um, the, the basics, the background in, in a sense was also that there's few billion um, users around the world that basically are accustomed to touchscreen operation, so merely um, a gesture and tap-based operation of, of smartphones, tablets, uh, media devices, um, even, the, even the laptops and, and TVs. So, so people know how to use them. And, and this is the driver also behind. So our main, main focus point was to, to, to create a, a gesture-based user interface um, in, in that sense. So, also, um, from a IMSC standpoint, um, because we enable uh, true three-dimensional uh, contouring for 
HMI or the illumination structures. Uh, we've, we've adopted basically that philosophy in the design. So we, we are not having any flat surfaces in, in, in this particular design, but it's um, not heavily contoured, but uh, there, there's distinctive uh, shapes for each different functions in the steering wheel. Um, so uh, what then for the, for the functional logic itself, um, it's kind of a, I, I would uh, describe it. It's a, it's a combination of PlayStation logic where you have the controller, uh, the user never really looks at the controller uh, but uses, you know, multiple fingers, at least four fingers for steering, guiding and triggering actions. And you get basically all the visual cues back from the TVs or, or external displays. So this is technically the same principle. So, so you operate with thumbs or fingers and, and the visual cues are coming from the displays. It could be a, a, a IP cluster display. It could be the center display. Um, better yet, if there's a, a head up display, so that's even better. Or in the future, it could be a virtual lenses that, that you're wearing while while driving so so there's multiple different ways to basically provide the visual cues for for the hmi function logic itself um so of course uh some of the the best known um interfaces we, we borrowed a little bit the the ipod so so we have the scroll wheel uh three-dimensional form um so it's it's basically running the menus and adjustments in the system and traveling is done with the gestures itself, up and down, left and right, uh, multi-fingers, taps and so forth, so, so on. Also, what we did, uh, we implemented basically a capacitive ASIL function. So it's been a debated that can you do um, ASIL function, safety related functions with capacity touch because of possibility to um, um, false touch uh, activations. So we designed the system for example, cruise control here such that there's absolutely impossibility to false oper falsely operate, for example, speed um, increase or decrease or distance increase, decrease in, in the steering wheel. So uh, that's for the disc opening the discussion with, uh, with uh, OEMs and tier ones in the automotive that, that how, and, and, and we, we showcase a, a one style that, that could be implemented uh, for safety related functions. Um, a little bit about the, uh, the three-dimensional HMI design itself. So as you can see, we have a very, very ultra thin uh, structure, uh, which we have the light element with IMSC, the transparent part, um, which also acts as a carrier for uh, Canada-based touch film, which is bonded over the, the part. So uh, we wanted to create a, a fully three-dimensional HMI system with illumin integrated illumination. Uh, for the purpose to showcase that how thin um, structure we can make uh, with all this, let's say, sophisticated functionality uh, from the touch operation point of view, but also the lighting point of view. And, and this is something that uh, I would 99.9% .9 sure uh, say uh, that there is no competent solution which, which basically can integrate in, in this form factor. So. Um, for the scroll wheel, we have a, a three-dimensional concave shape to, to guide basically the finger, whether it's a thumb or otherwise operated. Um, and the logic buttons, the turn signals, the home and the cruise control, they are in their own um, separated um, recess areas. So, so to minimize basically the, the false touch operation of those buttons as well, um, they are placed in the areas that you intentionally have to move a little bit the fingers around to basically uh, activate them. So this was um, a, a combination of how the how the UX design converts into the uh, surface modeling. A um, bit about the applications and, and some unique um, um, aspects of them. Um, uh, this, the left and right zone, as you can see in the pictures, uh, they are actually fully configurable from a multi-touch standpoint. So of course the turn signals, the home and the cruise control are, are positioned as a, as a functional, the, the static logic buttons. 
which of course, uh, by printing them in, in different ways, you can actually place them in a different position. You can change the graphics, you can change the, the coloring. So um, one of the benefits of, of screen printing technology and still better, better yet, we, we uh, can maintain the same three-dimensional form by let's say adding or removing functions. So it's, it's technically a, a printing system. Um, but um, the user configurability comes into play so that we can actually swap the left and right side functional logics in the software level. So those circular areas are multi-touch areas, uh, whether you do operate them in a radial fashion or, or um, swipe fashion, uh, we can actually change the, the sides of, of the left functions to the right and, and vice versa. So um, something that's Again, 99% sure that uh, there is no um, viable implementations today that you can actually do this. Um, so um, one of the unique, unique aspects of, of the design itself. Uh, from the applications, um, our belief and, and seeing, um, this is the first time the, the navigation of the map controls are actually brought in, in this level directly into the steering wheel. So there's a full navigation um, with character input uh, as well on the, on the circular area. So you can, you can type in the, the address, you can, you can control the navigation system, you can have the maps uh, zoomed out, uh, you can have the maps orientation as well in, in those areas. So um, it's a very versatile. For the user, user itself, um, one of the ideas were for the user configurability is that uh, you can create your own gestures. You can basically define uh, some functional logics that, that you are accustomed to. Uh, so, so you can technically, you can configure this steering wheel concept into your own liking. So um, something that is opening a totally different flavor of, of how the, the steering wheels could be all, all the HMIs and the GUIs could be operate, uh, uh, designed in the future um, for a, a driver-centric uh, comfortability in a, in a sense. And again, uh, the capacity basal function features are hands-on wheel detections in the rim side, uh, the turn signals, uh, cruise and start and stop functions, uh, which are all designed with the capacity with touch technology. Um, then shortly, the, the illumination architecture itself. So as you can see, we have those uh, transparent glow, glow drinks, um, which are pretty cool looking, but they have a, a specific function as well. So um, we consolidate informative warnings and of course the, the decorative lighting into those uh, rings as well. Uh, so the idea was to to kind of a test, try and test that, can we actually consolidate uh, different warning signs, signals, information, informative signals into light um, um, perspective into the steering wheel, which kind of opens up the possibility that it's, it's primarily in front of you almost. Um, it engages your peripheral vision, so you can basically concentrate on, on the driving, on, on the street in front of you, and those glow windows and, and the surrounding areas can be used as a, as a visual output for any kind of a, a colored indication tones that, that there could be in a, in a vehicle. So uh, you don't have to look for them. You, it's, it's basically very convenient location uh, in front of, the, let's say, in the field of your uh, uh, vision uh, while driving and, and so forth. And then um, that was the shortly the, the UX um, philosophy, the design, uh, why we selected this way um, for the HMI and the, the illumination itself. Um, hope you enjoyed. Uh, the last um, slide after this one is, I believe, from the last week uh, from the software integration. A, a very short video of the actual um, Origo. Uh, and, and this particular uh, video shows a little bit the, the light performance in the, in the, in the daylight conditions. So uh, Tua, if you, if you 
click on the on the play and let's see. All right. So uh, thanks from my behalf, and and Timo will take over now for the for the graphical user interface design. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Hasse, and. Uh... Uh, welcome to the internet also from my, my behalf. I'm, uh, so I'm Timo Pasi, I'm a business development manager in Sealy Auto. And uh, Sealy Auto uh, is, is a uh, professional services company. Uh, we are uh, focusing on the HMI development. So basically on two frontiers. One is the HMI innovation and, and naturally this uh, Oricos steering wheel falls into category. So we, we are uh, working uh, by creating or helping the especially the design studios on, on OEMs and tier ones for the with rapid prototyping, create uh, rapidly the user interfaces for prototyping new, new innovations. We also uh, perform some uh, technology discoveries and also have been working with some concept car development. The, the other part in uh, our services is then we, we work with uh, HMI development with the production cars. So uh, I think we just recently calculated something like 3 million cars currently are on the roads where we have contributed to the uh, HMI development. And uh, we also not just the uh, UI development and design, we also uh, work with the uh, supporting uh, 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 work there like the, the analy analytics of the HMI and uh, automation and um, that kind of sort of uh, backend uh, stuff there. So that this is this is our uh, our sort of offering. We we don't have any products, but we we provide uh, provide our service and our our expertise. Um, yeah, then if we go to the some brief facts of Sealy Auto. So uh, we have worked since 2013 in, in automotive industry. Automotive industry and part of, we are part of the, the Sealy, part of the Sealy uh, corporation and uh, for our automotive delivery operations, uh, uh, we, are, we have an office in Oulu actually just across the street of Taktotec. So that's a good place to cooperate with Taktotec and then, then in, in um, Poland R&D offices and then uh, customer facing uh, offices in US and uh, in, in Germany. And uh, during uh, we have worked during the, the years with uh, leading uh, tier one and uh, OM companies and, and just taking up from the from the names here Pinin Farina. With Pinin Farina, we this year worked together with the Autonomia concept that Pinin Farina developed. It's also in this kind of innovative concept, and we were responsible for that Autonomia, uh, the, also the, the user interface design and uh, implementation for that concept car. Okay, that briefly about Sealy Auto, but let's then go to the uh, Oracle steering wheel and a bit of the drivers of the user interface. Uh, design so so one of the trends uh, for the uh, behind the design of the user digital user interface the uh, what we use so uh, is is actually a, the, one of the big challenges currently what what is there so there uh, there's more and more functionality and features in cars more digital things in the cars but at the same time uh, the, those uh, uh, the drivers and users, they, they urge for easier use, seamless and, and uh, integrated uses so that you don't really, you don't need to think how, how, the, how you operate the car, how you, uh, how you put the, the HVAC uh, functionality on or how you operate the radio, how do you work with navigation. So that, that, that's the one, one key trend and, and uh, Really, really a challenge what comes to the design of the user interface. So how to make it simple, but at the same time enable the users of the, of the 
functionalities that are added more and more to the car. And related to that, the other, other trend, uh, what, what is behind the design is the decluttering of the UI. So keeping the user interface itself simple so that the, the driver is presented the right information at the right time at the right place. So you, you, you can focus to the uh, street and traffic and the information is presented you that way that you, uh, whenever you place to the, to the cluster, then the information you need is directly there available and, and very visible. You don't need to start looking at that where, where is that uh, particular, uh, like for example, the ADAS related thing or whatever, whatever there. So that, that's the other trend what we had uh, behind the uh, actual user interface design. So if, if we then go to the uh, uh, further to the design language itself. So uh, if you go to the next slide. <laughs> so the, uh, uh, when, when we, uh, here you can see the, the basic design elements of the Origo uh, user interface. So the one, uh, one thing what we used in what comes to design language is we, we wanted to uh, reflect the physical form of the steering wheel in the user interface. So uh, the, the wings, how we call the, the this, uh, areas in the steering wheel, so those are replicated as this uh, black wings in the user interface. And uh, also in, uh, in, in the this black wings, wings is then presented uh, whatever uh, functionality or whatever application is, is being used at uh, what time in that way that the visual appearance uh, matches the uh, UX logic, physical UX logic. So for example, this rotating slide, so like here in the playlist, it's, it's this kind of curved form so that it, it gives you the directly intuition, intuition so that, okay, you need to use your thumb to scroll the list or then uh, the volume adjustment. Then uh, also here the circular form directly matches the circular uh, scroll area so that uh, you don't really need to think uh, what, what button to use or how to operate, but it's, it's clearly directly indicated in the user interface. What, what is the logic to use the uh, application. Then the then what has already mentioned um, the uh, one of the unique things and uh, unique ways uh, is how how the navigation and maps are controlled with the Oracle steering wheel. So uh, the the for example, let's take the zooming. So zooming happens with the both thumbs. So, so basically you, you put your thumb so to the slide area, then zoom uh, or swipe out or swipe in with both thumbs and then the, the map is zoomed uh, as well. So that's that's also, it comes into the way and you don't need to, you don't actually, you don't need to take your hands off the steering wheel to uh, zoom up and operate the map. And the other, other unique thing with the uh, uh, touch area is that uh, you can type the destination, you can type the letters with, uh, if you are right-handed on the right-hand side, just swipe in with your, with your thumb the letters so it recognize your writing if you need to write. So also here, you don't need to uh, go to the center screen and start uh, uh, typing letters there, but you can operate everything on the uh, steering wheel. And here also the two hand controls also in the navigation and selecting the forms of uh, the, you select the primary functionality on the right hand side and then on the left hand side you, you do the additional controls like search the results or select the destination and so forth. So those, uh, those are the, uh, one of the key uh, sort of drivers and areas uh, what comes to the user interface uh, design and uh, if you if you go to the then to the actual implementation part. So uh, 
what we have here, we have a, a basically automatically we create implementation of the user interface software. So uh, as Hassa mentioned, there are some of these standard cluster elements, uh, ADA things and so forth, included in the design and implementation already. And the software platform, what we have used in Oregon is, is the widely used Kansi platform by Rightware. And, and actually the using the UI, Kansi UI, Kansi Connect, and also the Kansi maps there for the maps functionality. And all this then runs on the automotive grade uh, NXP IMX8 hardware. Hardware, so this, this uh, is a sort of ready-made automotive grade implementation of we have here. And here's also the now one of the pixels of the actual steering wheel when we have that, as, as Hasse mentioned, in software integration and, and final testing around uh, uh, last week. Okay, that, that's uh, that about the Oracle steering wheel, the, uh, wheel and uh, user interface there. And then if you think about the IMSE uh, technology as a HMA uh, enabler, so what what is uh, the one, one thing what is uh, what we are all all the time driving is is to have a as already said intuitive and also safe uh, HMI. So uh, the one one key target for uh, I would say on every OMS uh, OM, OM, OEM is to uh, reducing the driver distraction so that the, the, in whatever situation the driver can focus as uh, fully as possible to the to the street and traffic and uh, uh, all other sort of uh, passengers or whatever in the uh, well, in the in the streets so um, and uh, what is the challenge in the in the nowadays is that the uh, traditional touch displays they they actually cause distraction because when you need to operate it it uh, they you need to turn your almost full attention to see that uh, okay especially uh, i would take the like navigation when you need to type in the destination and, and, and car is, is moving and you, you need to reach out and type the letters it's really tedious and, and uh, you really need to focus where you put your finger to get the, get the right address written down so that, that is one, uh, one um, sort of challenge clearly there but when we embed this um, touch sensitive surfaces uh, also haptics and, and this kind of light elements to panels, steering wheel, uh, and, and wherever they are from the user experience point of view feasible. So that, that makes them uh, using the car, using the controls much more natural. So that they, they are like you rest your, for example, you rest your hand on the, on the uh, door, for example, so the controls like controlling the windows and so they are right on your fingertips uh, for example so the IMSE technology enables that way that you you can have these thin control elements wherever they are from the user experience point of view best uh, located okay i think that's uh, all from my from my part i i want more thank for that the opportunity to uh, tell more about the uh, Oracle steering wheel and uh, if you go to auto.sealy.com you can uh, look more what we are doing and uh, what is our offering and uh, what cool things we have done uh, not just with Oracle but also with other like uh, the Pinin Farina case. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you Timo and thank you Hasse for your great presentation and next we have the live Q&A. Okay, now is the time for the live Q&A with Hasse and Timo. Welcome on board. And audience, now is the time for you to send in your questions via the Q&A box. So please keep those coming in. So let's begin. So Timo, how do you see the overall automotive interior develop around this kind of user experience? 
So I, I think that the one uh, one thing uh, what is in the in the trends is actually the the overall this kind of seamless environment. So all, all blends together like the hardware design controls and then the actual digital user interface. I think that's the that's the one key key trend what we are seeing the making making the uh, overall experience that way seamless that you 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 feel like a home when you sit in the car. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. How about you, Hasse? What do you think? Um, well, of course, the the displays that display seems to be pretty much trending. Um, outside that, in in certain extent, the the simplicity is is coming into play. So. Um, if we go back to a traditional, let's say, medium to high-end cars <clears throat> today, sold as a new one, without, let's say, pre-touch or presented display focused, there's there's tens of buttons for driver, basically. Uh, lots of logic that you have to memorize, learn, use, and, and concentrate. So uh, it's, it's, it's departing from that, uh, certainly. Uh, so, in, in a way, certain simplicity is coming into play. Um, from the lighting perspective, of course, there's going to be a lot more, a lot more Christmas tree-like effects uh, coming into play as well. So, so uh, lots of kind of a fashion statements in 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 that sense. All right. So, the kind of, um, many possibilities that they the automotive interior could develop into. Uh, we just saw a nice uh, sneak peek or quick tour about the uh, Origo steering wheel and about its user logic. So do you also think that this kind of user logic could be adapted to other areas in the car than just a steering wheel? And what do you think about, for example, other industries like smart home? Well, I would say it's it's, in a way, it's universal, so it, it is not really automotive focused. It's we, we just decided to to design it into a steering wheel because it's a it's a very kind of a unique unique place, and and we can see particularly with IMC Tech, Tech that in particular steering wheel area we have a lot to give, and and we can we can go in in very different type of uh, aesthetics and and the HMI, but. Other industries, basically the, the similar type of gesture-based um, um, logic is, is fairly on point. Um, so technically any, any HMI, uh, if you think um, today, let's say, like I said in, earlier, there's a few billion touchscreen users, but that you have to usually watch. So you cannot really use smartphones or tablets without Without actually touching or gazing it, but uh, once we once we integrate the, the surface contouring, um, then you can actually start to operate those by by just uh, merely you know you find where they are, and depending of course the logic is is if it's a touch touch based event or or proximity or gesture based event with which basically a mid air proximity. So then in certain industries uh, home automation. Um, medical, you, you don't really have to touch anymore. Uh, so you can still operate, but, but you don't have to touch. And of course, um, in, in, that, in that, that said, um, in those areas, um, the, the, let's say particularly the COVID is, is interesting to, you know, touch or non-touch. So you have to think that the logic of how how the system operates, what, what the HMI controls. So, so you have to kind of uh, be a little bit more inno innovative in a, in a sense that what it does when you do a particular, let's say a, a gesture or tap or whatever, wh what's the purpose? What's the logic behind that? So, so uh, it, it's, it can be very different to a, a regular standard knob or button so, or switch or, or something like that. So um, uh, there's, I'd say, um, sky's the limit in a sense. Absolutely. How about you, Timo? What do you think? Could this kind of user logic be adapted to other areas in the car as well? Yeah, for for, for sure. I think um, I think similar things. But um, 
what Hasse said and the, the uh, I think what was shown in the video in the beginning that the, the idea of similar uh, controlling and user experience that you are used to use uh, when you are operating your mobile phone. I think that's the, uh, I think that's basically now, nowadays that's uh, familiar intuitive for everybody. So it, it could for sure be uh, applied like for example to home, home appliances uh, to use there as well, this kind of uh, control mechanism. All right, very interesting. Then um, we have a question. I think Timo might want to answer this first. So unintended activation of capacity with touch patterns is always an issue. Could you give some more details on how you avoid this in the Oracle steering wheel? Yeah, I think that in, in Oracle implementation, it's mainly, um, uh, there's no force sensing. So it's mainly done with the timeouts and uh, how the, um, uh, the interpreting the sensors, how the uh, your thumb moves on the sensor uh, mat. So it, it, it's based on that. So for example, if um, it's detected that your thumb is uh, long enough in, in uh, one position, then it's uh, interpreted as a select gesture. And then when there's a movement from the sensor, uh, sensors, then it's a swipe. So that's, uh, that's the basic uh, principle. So that, uh, this kind of timeouts and then uh, interpreting the different um, sensor uh, actions, what is coming out from the sensor map. Okay, thank you, Timo. And then, um, have you performed user tests with Origo steering wheel and what is the user's feedback? Maybe Hasse could take this. Um, up to date, uh, we are still in a, in a integration, uh, fine tuning of the so software and the censoring. Uh, so we haven't done actually the, the user testing or the UX testing, the, the logic testing as, as, of, as of yet with, uh, with the large quantities. Uh, the plan is that we'll, we'll run uh, by, by lead of uh, Tampere University, the, the testing, uh, once the steering wheel in a, in a, in a state that, that we can actually uh, do all the, the plan testing. So uh, eventually during the, the first half of, of next year, uh, we'll have uh, a report out of that. Um, there's a couple discussions um, Certainly, we do it in in the lab simulator. Uh, so, so Tampere University has a a, a drive lab with, with all the all the gear uh, and, and assemblies, so they can do uh, a virtual virtual driving with the with the steering wheel. The second discussion we have uh, a potential integration in the in the live vehicle and and run it in a, in a Nokia entire test track um, later on. So, we'll we'll see how that plays out but uh, certainly it's in the plan. Okay, thanks Hasse. Then there's a question about a uh, large display. So maybe Hasse, you could comment that uh, how IMSC can function together with displays. Yeah, as, as, as in the Origo, the, the, like I said, um, that the philosophy was really kind of a PlayStation-like. So, so we, rely the display, head-up displays, it could be virtual, it could be augmented in, in the head-up displays, the visual feedback. So, so technically, um, the Origo steering wheel is a remote controller for, for any application functionality feature in the car. Um, and that could be extended to other areas in the vehicle as well, like you said, in, uh, asked in the beginning. So it could be in the center console, it could be in the door, it could be the dash, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So similar, let's say logic with the same design or altered design can be, it can be very diverse uh, where you place it, but, uh, but actually the functional logic is, is really about having the visual feedback. So technically the display then could be, um, and we've had this kind of a 2.0 or a good discussion of, of how we kind of a, leverage the display so so is there a, a specific driver view and is there a specific let's say a generic view uh which is outside outside the let's say ip cluster area um what's the passenger role uh for viewing the information and using the the logic so so yes certainly the the 
large display or any display is is needed with with Oregos type of um, user interface. Okay, thanks, Hasse. And then we have time for one last question. This is about uh, haptic feedback. So, is there any integrated in the Orego steering wheel? Um, to date, uh, we are working on on with with Tampere University about the the active haptics um, technology. Um, so it will be integrated. Uh, there, we have some some initial results already. Uh, it's going to be integrated into the steering wheel uh, during the first half of of next year. Um, initially, when we started the project, we we decided that there's not going to be a haptics uh, active haptics involved, but everything is relying on the passive haptics uh, as well. The the like so the usability is something that you control with thumbs and you get the visual feedback. We, we, we have um, also the audible feedback. So for example, if you scroll the menus or the, or the, the volume, you, you get this tick, tick, tick sound, uh, which is not coming from, the, from any haptic system. Uh, there's no force sensing. So, so initially the idea was to replicate as much as possible PlayStation type of logic that, that you actually, everything is relying on the visual feedback and you just operate this as a remote controller. So, so uh, in, in a sense, you don't need the, the haptics in, let's say, rotating or something. Of course, you can add it. Uh, as I said, uh, it's in the development. Uh, it's going to be very different to uh, any conventional uh, market available haptics technology. So, so we'll we'll update on that once it's in a in a state that we can we can uh, speak it openly. Okay, thanks, Hasse. Timo, would this uh, would integrating uh, this kind of haptic actuators uh, change the graphical user interface design? Uh, um, not in major scale, but there was be, for sure be some. Um, some changes uh, that uh, because now when when you are hap you have the haptics then in the steering wheel you don't necessarily need always the same visual uh, feedback as as is, as is, it is there now so that there could be some some differences and changes uh, when when you have the haptics integrated. All right, thank you, Timo, and thank you, Hasse, for your presentation, and also for this Q and A for your answers. And next up, we have the Tactic Vision presentation by Tactic CTO starting in a few minutes. And that is also followed by the live Q&A session. So audience, please send in your questions using the Q&A box and see you in a few minutes.
All right, welcome back. And now it's the time for the final presentation of the IMSC Days 3.0 by our very own TACTEC CTO, Antti Keren. Hi, Antti. Like this, yes. Hello, now we can hear Hello, you. hello. As you see, this is not recorded because we couldn't edit that, that away. So. Hello to everybody, uh, and thank you to, uh, to our uh, chairperson Tuotakinen for welcoming me to speak about tactic technology vision today. Uh, this is a very interesting time. This is basically the first time I will be speaking about the next, next level of IMSE publicly. It's been some of the customers under NDA know what we are dealing with in the labs so far, but, but I haven't been talking about these things in public yet. And it's gonna be very, very exciting to do that first time. And uh, not only that kind of, kind of announcement kind of things, but also further vision what we are doing, a little bit of insight where, where we appear to hear. So, I can't help but start with the quotes from renowned Dr. Peter Harrop, the chairman of ID Tech X analyst company. I've been using this a lot, but it still really hits the point. The electronics has been a component in the box for 100 years. So there's kind of, kind of conceptual call for structural electronics overall. And uh, IMSE is one of the important points in that development. We're getting the components out of the box right to the structures which are needed. And some of the implications are quite obvious uh, and discussed during this seminar in, and in numerous other places. And we are really allowing new kind of design innovation and also support sustainability when we are reducing traditional electronics and plastics used in uh, electronic devices. So thanks again for Peter for this one. We are still following your words. Okay, let's go for new kind of market demands. What, what have been here and are very general, of course, not only to IMSE, but general trends all around in, in electronics when getting getting out of the when getting the components out of box right to the structures. First things what we ha already have there in IMSE is personalization and then uh, then uh, easy variant variant control variant management variant manufacturing. We are talking about printing now. When you when you did the variant of personalization with traditional technologies, it usually actually means changing materials, obvious, but changing the tools also. Different positions of a button or whatsoever means different tooling for, for plastic parts. But now when the functionalities come basically come out of a printer, but we are talking about personalization by printing, not by tooling. So that's what we are serving already. Let's go a little bit further. Again, an obvious word nowadays, everything should be digitalized. 
uh, this is kind of, it is there with IMSE already, but not quite in the sense that while we have a free form plastic structure there together with functionalities, the controls are still outside the plastic part. So we need a, need some kind of uh, external control board for, for getting the connections to outside world and control from the outside main systems or, or system systems. That's a, that's, a, that's a main step of what I, be, I will be talking today. And, uh, but that's only not enough. There's another step to take. Well, new market demands for devices. What happens later on? Devices are just things. So, so electronics, electronic functionalities become completely ubiquitous. Uh, uh, that means the box and the components disappear somewhere. They disappear in the structures, whether it's uh, textiles, walls, uh, you name it, not to speak about plastic parts where we where we concentrate on with IMSE. So personalization, digitalization, which I will talk about today a lot, and ubiquitous systems where the functionalities disappear. Disappear and then also they are everywhere. Okay, let's back to the components in the box. We are living year 2020 and the 2001 Space Odyssey happened 20 years ago. And we are still having the large majority of our electronic functionalities as a components in the box. Here's the prime example of that, the overhead control panel of a car. A couple of dozen unique plastic parts. So when you move a button, you change a bunch of different tools, 64 different sub assemblies, numerals, PCBs, a lot of hand assembly. How does injection molded structural electronics answer to this? Well, having similar overhead control panel, here I kind of purposefully uh, took away the little control board underneath the system to see also the future of the system. Okay, what do we have here? We can have new locations for electronics basically anywhere and move those electronics by basically changing printing and, and uh, pick and place of the components. In increased integration level of structures, having the functionalities inside 3D thin plastic parts and how, how the market market really asks Robbie, rapid growth of use cases when electronics and these functionalities go everywhere and anywhere and structural electronics also gives complete new kind of user experience think about things what I call control on demand The, the present day example of that is the black panel panels of the car. There's black plastic until you need something there. So the controls icons appear, but this goes, this can go and goes to other places also. Well, car will become, is and will become more and more a second home for us. But the first home, the home, instead of having distinct boxes with, with electronics, also here, the functionalities can disappear in the structures with different decorations and also different functions. And brand differentiation by design. Now we have this 3D and printed decoration available in IMSE. And very efficient, uh, total cost of ownership because of disappearance of many of the assembly, assembly steps and other integration parts. Well, and then 
always so important thing, our environment. Using less plastics, using less PCBs, traditional electronics, at the end is less of carbon dioxide uh, environmental stress. And yet, we are talking about plastic parts here, and we are thinking hard and, and uh, being very active in adapting new kind of sustainable materials, bio-based plastics, recycled plastics, and so on. Not an easy way, of course, now that we are talking about a little, little bit more complex things as traditional plastic parts, but yet we will be there. Okay, let's talk about a little bit of the technology horizon of IMSE. What we have now already, we have thin and light systems, less thickness, less weight, very reliable and durable functional plastic parts. Once the electronics sustained the stresses of the manufacturing process, they are well covered because they are embedded right within the plastics. Seamless, one piece, complex assemblies. Variants are made by printing, new kind of design freedom, new kind of build efficiency, fewer parts, less tooling and assembly, what I mentioned already. And again, sustainable. And what I've been talking about today quite a lot is about the next step, which here in three boxes, intelligent digital parts, no external control, reduced external signals, that means when you have a lot of components within plastics and no control inside, you will have a lot of wires out. But let's get rid of those wires today. And yet, when the integration level gets higher, the uh, complicity of functionalities get higher and new kinds of functionalities are available. Okay, let's have a big picture about these developments right now. Now we have components in a box. And making that IMSE, the box becomes functional. But yet, yes, we do have that external control board. And the next step, what we call integrated IMSE, the main topic of today, the controls go also inside freeform plastic parts. So in quite an ideal case, we would have four wires out. That means power, ground, and digital input and output. Four wires instead of dozens of different wires. And we have taken away this design distraction the external control board. This, gonna, this is tomorrow. But what happens after that? The day after tomorrow? We have four wires. Let's get rid of those also. Think about completely ubiquitous uh, world with functionalities. Think about IoT. Think about industry 4.0 or 5.0, we would have this self-sustained freeform, independent interconnected modules, just radios for, co for communication between these modules and other systems. That would be the kind of biggest step, future step, what we see ahead of us. Okay, we have the basic IMSE today available, and tomorrow we will have this integrated IMSE. It really means new kind of performance, upgrades to DOS, increased feature complexity, a lot more different functionalities, a lot more uh, 
number of components inside when they are controls, controlled right inside the structure. And the, the overall, overall development of decentralized architecture, instead of having, having a central control for many devices, having just a digital bus between digital elements. And simplified electrical inter interface comes with that. Instead of many, many analog lines, we would have digital lines for that. So that is the next step for tomorrow, what we are talking about mostly today. And I have to open the kind of last step for seeing today, the self-sustained structural electronics, which is also coming. And we have some of the elements visible already. We are not quite yet there. If I say that it's day after tomorrow, we might get very busy if we want to give this out on Friday, but please give us some few years time for this step. What it really means, we have some background for that. So in long term, there would be really independent, power independent electronics, structural electronic systems. We have done early trials years ago with several partners. Good example is, is Brologium from Taipei who make printed batteries and we have emolded those in thermoplastic mm. polyurethane and make those rechargeable batteries work there. You can actually make flexible TPU parts with batteries. These, these I would, I would uh, frankly say that these are at demonstrator level and we haven't continued this work since a few years. There wasn't enough demand for that and the overall, <clears throat> overall uh, state of the art wouldn't allow us to make mass production for that kind of parts. But well, we could, we have done trials and even working, working electronics parts with that kind of things. And another, another example here, we can encapsulate the traditional drive button batteries within flexible systems by covering them with a separate cover, cover button-like cover systems and in mold those. You can in principle make those. And yet another important example, which also points out to the external needs of enablers for this kind of independent things. Good example of that is printed flexible organic photovoltaic systems. So basically solar power systems, which, which in basically would be very suitable for IMSE. We have those on, those on a flexible plastic substrate and later on could be used in IMSE parts, but not quite there yet. So important point here is that before we go, go really hard to this kind of technology, we need to have these enablers mature enough. And of course, the market demand should be there. Our customers knocking on the door and, uh, and telling us the need. So that would be later on. And when you have the self-sustained devices straight out of the injection mold, molding machine, that means we are serving IoT, independent sensing and communication systems in free form structures, maybe a sticker having all the needed functionalities for controlling and monitoring systems. Okay, that was, that was the story told in short, but let us have one more important thing. I've been talking about linear development from, from no integration to total integration of, of electronics into plastics. But that, that is obviously not all what we do here and what we can offer together with our partners. The development continues within IMSC it will continue within an integrated IMSE, even though we would have completely self-sustained structural electronic systems. So we are constantly and continuously developing new kind of materials, platforms, 
new kind of form factors, new kind of sizes of devices, new features for things, new kind of functionalities, what the market needs, and new kind of use cases for the technology. So the present day IMSE can and will be able to serve many, many of these needs, if not most of these needs in the future also. So the work continues in basic IMSE level, even though we would go to the higher integration level in the future. Okay, my main topic today, what we are working on, and the first time what I'm being, I, I'm, I'm talking publicly about is the integrated IMSE, how the control systems go inside plastics. And why? First, why do the control need, the systems need to go into plastics? Okay, let's get, first of all, we, have, we want to get rid of the external PCB for many reasons, for design reasons, environmental reasons, for, 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 for withstanding different elements. And another point, very important, we have made very complex present day IMSE part uh, systems with dozens of different components and functionalities. And it's quite obvious when you don't have the control inside, you need the analogs, analog lines out of the plastic. And let's take 20 individual RGB LEDs. So they are controlled individually and plus touch control and other things it would need more than 60 lines out. 20 individually controlled RGB LEDs would need 60 lines plus one ground by themselves. And 20 LEDs is not even much. We have actually done parts with our customers with 100 LEDs, if not individual, but a big number of LEDs. And then, more complex functions. When you are able to encapsulate controls within the plastic, you can also encapsulate more complex functionalities. Different sensing systems, different communication systems distributed within plastic parts. Why I'm telling this distributed it's quite important concept in IMSC distributing the controls. We are not elect an electronics miniaturization company and the technology is not made for that. We're usually talking about quite, quite large part. Let's, let's put, it, put it that way from centimeters to, to even, even tens of centimeters in, in, in dimensions. <clears throat> so, there is no urgent need for miniaturization of control electronics, but distributing them around the plastic part. And then having touch, touch controls are a very important topic today. We don't want to have very long control lines for that because the conductive control lines, they work as capacitive sensors themselves. So very prone to, to erroneous signals for touch. So these are the big motivation for getting the controls inside plastic part. Okay, you can do it. We have done years ago, a system with control electronics on a little piece of flexible printed circuit right inside the plastic with no basically further treatments. And we can, we can make those work. We had, have had really nice demonstrators for that. They have helped us on the marketplace very much. Uh, but, but there is a but. Let's zoom inside the control systems in a part which has taken some environmental testing. the molded plastics don't adhere to components. It doesn't adhere well to the uh, 
the large parts of FPC. Molding process is tricky to control when you are not allowed to wash out the components needed in the controls. And not only this, you can still handle some of those things, especially the process control, but the process control doesn't help you handling the environmental stress in use. That, that in practice means <clears throat> environmental stress test in the lab, in which we are pretty good nowadays when automotive has helped us to do those minus 40 to, to plus 105 degrees, 80 degrees of temperature and 80% uh, humidity, minus 40 plus 80 shock test and so on. At the end, the interconnects within, within the assembly and outside the assembly actually break. And all the materials tend to delaminate, which is very general when you laminate FPC to plastic part. And it applies in in-molding also. So you cannot make commercial product with this kind of straight out of straight out of market kind of technologies. Putting putting your sub assembly on FPC or PCB right into the injection mold. Well, this is the important part of my talk. We do have a solution for that. <clears throat> what we call IMSE system in package, IMSE SIP. In my beautiful fingers, you see here one, one sample of system in package, which is made for IMSE process of, of in-molding electronics. What we have inside this package is a small PCB for dense electronics. There's nothing fancy about that. It's traditional electronics on PCB, and we know that we can make dense and complex systems for that. What is the important and innovative things here? That we have a plastic cup as a thermoplastic cover for protecting this assembly for, against process stresses. And while we have, have that as a thermoplastic cover, it ad adheres to molded thermoplastic in a natural manner. Inside that cup, there's electronics and barrier filler for keeping the elements out and withstanding the further process, process stresses such as injection mold. Furthermore, the pick and place process what IMSE is employing does not involve the soldering, which is obviously the state of the art of dense, dense electronics. So we actually need to widen the interconnects, not making smaller packages, but in practice, making larger packages with larger interconnects in order for, for the ad, uh, adhesion with glues happening in, in, in pick and place process. And we are, we are further, we are attaching the components right to the printed traces, not to the metallic copper traces as in traditional electronics. Again, there's a process step, process stresses involved, especially thermoforming implies some kind of stretch for, for the system in package also, when most of them, these, the, the thickness of the system in package implies a cavity in a, in a B side of a part. And this cavity is for, made by thermoforming and implies stress to the interconnects. When, while the backside of the SIP is optimized for IMSE, there is no more a problem. And this optimization also, together with specific uh, adhesion methods, reduces the thermal expansion stress during the lifetime of a part. So what do we have here? A 
a solution for so-called integrated MEs, IMSE, that means controls also inside plastic. Here we have our concept design for, for a white goods control panel, 3D, very light control panel, easy to modify, easy to personalize, and easier also for variant management. No more two inch, inches thick big box with components, which have, have to be varied between product variants. But you might just vary the graphics and functionalities within the same form factor. Okay, the bump on the back side contains the control system and the simple connector contains the digital input and output and electric power. So we do have a solution for integrated IMSE in the works. This is the first time I'm talking about this in public, but I, this is not the thing what you get off the shelf right now. In order to sp speak further, it, it, is, it means obviously going under NDA and discussing our product management and sales for details about the development. The pilot projects are going on with several customers and me telling about this, this technology right now is, is a straight indication that the confidence level for having this out soon is very high. Almost there to giving it to public market. Okay, I'm already in the summary in our technology vision speak. And I still have a lot of time for this. So that there's gonna be a lot of time for questions and answers. <clears throat> I think it's better to have it short than too long. So what we have today, the functionality, needed functionality such as lighting, touch, hover control, antennas and so on, they are integrated in the freeform plastics already. And we have a lot of benefits for that, a lot of applications for that, even applications which wouldn't necessarily benefit from controls inside. We have a good, had good examples today and yesterday about that in, in several talks together with our partners and customers. But I am see tomorrow, functionalities and controls are integrated together. And as a side product, you get a very simple interconnections and evers, even slimmer systems, less, less, even less electronics PCBs used. So environmental sustainability is getting higher and higher. And another step, the day after tomorrow, wireless self-sustained structural electronics for, for IoT, for ubiquitous uh, functionalities anywhere and everywhere. But let us not forget about this continuously, new materials, new features within IMSE, whether it is integrated IMSE or, or self-sustained IMSE. So that's all for now. Thank you for everybody. And back to chairperson Tua, we have some extra time, maybe extra questions there. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Antti, for your great presentation. And indeed, we now have time for the Q&A. So please send in your questions using the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. And now is the time to ask your questions because this is the last live Q&A for this year's IMSD event. All right, we have a couple of questions here. So. And the, um, your technology is developed for licensing. What are the main differences compared if you were delivering the parts yourself? Uh, there is many differences, but, but I see the main difference here that 
that delivering a large amount of parts is is actually building up a manufacturing operation. While our core is the IP and knowledge about the processes, and then making a large manufacturing operation is obviously a big investment and probably a big, big concentration of certain kind of applications while we want to develop the manufacturing, the integration technology on the background and let the customers more or less dictate the final applications. And that gives a lot of lot more variety to technology and applications. Okay, thank you, Antti. And then question about the materials development. So does Taxec develop materials for IMSC as well? Excuse me, could you please repeat? Uh, it's a question about uh, does Taxotec develop materials for IMSC? No. And there's an important reason for that. Not, not <laughs> bluntly, no, but, but very early on we decided that the materials should be in the total control of suppliers. As a technology provider, as a small and young company, we don't want to control the supply chain at all. And that's a benefit of our customers. And that's why we have partnered with many companies about the materials. They are professionals in material science. They have uh, ensured supply chains and supply for that. And we call, instead of making and controlling the materials, we collaborate with those partner companies to improve their material, material portfolio for IMSE use. So that, that's, that's the choice in the sake of our customers and overall business to have a supply chain separate. And we are able to concentrate on the core knowledge of ours. It doesn't make sense to, to make everything yourself when there's bigger and better companies around. We have very good examples in IMSE days here. Let's take in the material size, for example, Covestro, uh, and then the components, uh, Osram, and sorry if I didn't mention somebody yet, but, but uh, those are important parts of the overall ecosystems and ensured supply chain. Okay, thanks, Antti. And this links well to the next question. So how do your partners link to your technology vision and what kind of technologies are important for IMSC future? <clears throat> the, the partners, what I already mentioned, there's a deep and good collaboration with material providers about improving materials about validating their materials and components for IMSE. That, that is absolutely vital for that. Absolutely. And uh, the new kind of functionalities come, come from outside usually. If we need new kind of component, it comes, comes from suppliers and partners and, and on the marketplace. So, so the, the partners and customers obviously play a vital role in development. Absolutely. Then we have a question and, and greetings. That very nice developments. What are line or spacing and conductivity requirements for adding IMSC SIP to IMSC parts? And what about the heat management of the controller? Uh, the co conductivity, uh, I'm not sure if I get the question right, but well, we have we we make many many kinds of controls, touch controls, and we control LEDs with Tactotech SIP. So so those those are certainly available. Conductivities are sufficient for that. And a heat management question is very good. This SIP structure actually, when you need extreme heat heat controls, there it allows you to build build heat heat control on the back side of the SIP. When we see, see the, the bottom of the SIP is actually on the back of the part. But even more important, heat management can be distributed. 
don't put all the heat, heating points in the same place. We have good examples together in uh, pilot projects with our customers that controlling a large amount of RGB LEDs, you are, you are in, no, in, in no case you should control them on the same point, but distribute the controls around the part. So that's, that's the first step. And the second step would be using, using the maybe even external heat, heat sinks or that kind of things, which we don't, didn't encounter yet. So we are able to do the heat control without those so far. Okay, thanks. And um, then how do you realize the IMSC system in package components? And I think this refers to actually making the components. Mm. To, what was the last sentence there? That we have a question that how do you realize the IMSC SIP components? And I guess there is, this refers to um, making the components. Ah, the components are off the shelf. So PCB is traditional PCB. It's a normal PCB, no, no problem with that. And the components are off the shelf components. So we are making that sub assembly and the process itself, making the plastic cup and uh, filling that, it's, it's a very simple process indeed. So make a plastic cup with, with thermoforming and dicing those and, uh, and filling those and even, even this this process can be done done in in uh, in reels actually at the end. So so far we are doing the pilot products with our uh, uh, by us and with with very selected partners. And these are in pilot level, not in huge production yet. As I said, this is still a working progress and not uh, publicly available yet. Okay, thanks, Antti. Mm, then is the IC in integrated IMSC encapsulated via a breakout board or is it a proprietary package with direct bonding? Off the shelf, off the shelf component on the traditional PCB. The final encapsulation is our proprietary process, but the electronic assembly itself is off, basically traditional off the shelf. Yep, exactly. And then the electric components are sealed in the IMSC parts. How about the heating of the electric, electric components after long time running? That, that is a similar thing, what happens in traditional also, that you have to control that carefully. And don't, and we, we know and we can simulate and calculate what are the limits for, <clears throat> for specific applications. Of course, I can, I can tell you already that if you need a several watt LED somewhere, IMSC is probably not the place. You shouldn't seal that within a plastic because the point, the, the point, point heat stress is too high for that. But when, when talking about, uh, let's say, normal LEDs and such things, IMSC is a good choice. Okay, thanks, Antti. And then... Uh, based on your experience, what are the main barriers uh, to changing into the IMSC technology? Since uh, IMSC is a revolution, not a just a new technology. Main barriers, very often mindset, very often uh, breaking the silos within companies. Electronics is no more separate item from mechanics. So we are do, really doing a disruption here. So these might and are actually sometimes barriers for that. And uh, the manufacturing itself is not a huge barrier. Of course, if you are absolutely not willing to, to adapt the manufacturing there, then maybe something else is better or finding the partners for that. Uh, but we are coming to an important point also that we are not here talking about investment levels such as making a semiconductor line when we are talking about billions but we are using using 
more or less, uh, not even more or less, but exactly traditional manufacturing methods with well, where the equipment is well available and non-expensive. So our complete pilot line for manufacturing here in Oulu, which is, which is industrial manufacturing line, is order of 2 million, not 20 or 200 million or 2, two billion. Okay, and I think this kind of relates to the previous question in a way. Is there any competing technology to IMSC? Many competing technology. The biggest competition what we are dealing with is traditional electronics and traditional structures. Okay, and when will we see IMSC applications in mass volume cars? Well, that is a good question. Uh, uh, it's 22, 23 timescale. So pretty soon. Um, how about high speed digital signals? Is USB 3 doable with IMSC? Now we are getting to, to the very area that uh, my expertise, my expertise is not enough for that. It goes to the electronics guys. It goes to the electronics guys, but well, I don't see I don't see uh, any barrier for that. I, I do hope that there's somebody from our electronic side to, to give a precise an answer for that. Exactly. And, and I would like to remind here. So if your question doesn't get answered or you would like to know some, uh, more about something, please send us email to taxdeckevents.com and we'll do our best to help you further from there. Then we have a, uh, another question. Uh, putting the electronic board into the IMSC module makes sense, on the other hand. But then again, the higher complexity will drive the costs of the parts. At least yield will be a big issue. How is your experience on this? Uh, yield, yields are good with IMSC. That is not a big worry about that. But the common failure happening, which, is, which, which can happen in traditional also, the replacement, the rework is very difficult with IMSC. So I very often, often say that don't put your most expensive newest CPU within IMSC. And that's, that is a very good question in order to, to make some kind of limits for IMSC. So don't put the most expensive, most delicate parts within IMSC. So there is some limitations for that. But most of the electronics are, ru are run with quite simple and inexpensive control systems. All right, then I think we have the final time for one final question, question here. So when is the target year of development of the integrated IMSC? Uh, that, that, is, that is super important question here that, but our target to getting the IMSE SIP, the system in package, more publicly available is next year, 2021. All right. So that's that's pretty soon too. Looking forward to that. So we are we are busy. We have been busy about that. And as I said earlier, that I wouldn't speak about this if we were very, very close to that. Mm, exactly. Exactly. Thank you, Antti, for this Q&A session. And I think it's now time to wrap up the IMSC Days 3.0. So would you like to say a few words for the audience? Absolutely. So to wrap up these days, it, personally, I've been following all the speaks here and, and be very, very delighted and for, for what, what's been happening here. We have been having audience from 150 to 200 in all the time of the, the, the meeting here. So more than in any previous face-to-face -face IMSE days, which is great. And moreover, in comparison to those, what we have here, the depth of the speaks in collaboration between Tactic and our, our partners and customers, those have been great. So, so even those 
who are out of the ecosystem or, or newcomers in the IMSE talks have got a very, very good picture about what is happening there. Happening there. And I, I, that, that is the important part here, what, what is happening, the, the collaboration with the partners and, and superb job from organizers. So big thanks. The biggest thanks goes to two you, our dear chairperson, keeping everything in control and very beautiful recordings and that all the job well before the IMSE days, everything running smoothly. And thanks goes also to Mr. Janne Jaska, who's been the, the Mr. Control here, checking that all, all the mechanics of the of the meeting work there. And and Mrs. Sini Rytky, who who's the who's kind of the background person who is, who's been running this process up to these days. Very good job. And I've, I'm very happy about the speakers of our company also and the quality of the and depth of the, the speeches there. But, but again, the biggest thanks go to these IMSE days collaborators, what I'm showing here. There is customers. There's material providers, there's component providers, there is technology and machinery providers, designers, and other, other works also. So we already have a good part, very good sample of the ecosystem present on these IMSE days. And um, Well, last words from me is just big thanks to everybody involved. Thank you. Thank you, Antti, and, and a big thank you on my behalf as well to all of our wonderful presenters, partners and sponsors, and especially thank you to audience. It has been a great two days with you, and we hope to see you in person in Oulu, maybe already next year. And now, Antti, I think you should have a glass there with you. <laughs> Let's raise a toast to all of our presenters and audience. So, kippis. Kippis. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you again, and see you soon. Thank you. Bye.